So we'll send you out our November calendar. We've got several things coming up. As always, our support groups are on Wednesdays from one to two and Fridays from 11 to 12. We do have open groups, so they are open to people whose loved ones are still at home, people whose loved ones are placed either here or any place else, and uh, folks whose loved ones have passed away already. We also have a group specific to grief that meets on the second Saturday of each month. And grief does not mean that somebody so loved one has already passed. It just means that we have gone through a loss. And we know that uh, when we're dealing with dementia, we are dealing with loss all the time. So our grief group does not mean that their loved one has already passed necessarily. Um, again, you will get these slides uh, later today or first thing tomorrow. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started because we've got a lot to cover in an hour. And I still got a lot of people hopping on. So let me let everybody in. There's our objectives for those of you who are going to be getting your CEUs. We're going to talk about uh, communication practices and how our communication is going to change and how their communication is going to change as we go through each of the different stages of the disease. There's my information. I am the Director of Education and Family Support Services here at the West Center. I'm a licensed professional counselor and I was a school teacher for 20 years before that. So I do love to teach. I um, just got back from being gone for about 10 days as things are starting to open back up, getting to go out and do some conferences again. But one of the things that I focused on was end of life and on narrative therapy, where you use a person's story to do their therapy with them. And I have found that to be really beneficial with folks that are um, very early in their diagnosis of dementia uh, or who had mild cognitive impairment, as well as with families who are going through uh, uh, the journey of dementia. So first, let's just briefly talk about dementia, just kind of do an overview of dementia. Knowing that dementia is that umbrella term, I talk with healthcare professionals all the time who will even kind of misuse the word dementia and Alzheimer's. Keep in mind, dementia is an umbrella term, just like cancer is an umbrella term. If someone were to say, my loved one has cancer, our next question would likely be what type or kind of cancer. Same thing with dementia. My loved one has dementia, what type or kind of dementia. And then Alzheimer's is 50 to 75% of all dementias. So many, many times we'll hear someone say, my loved one has Alzheimer's, but they don't have dementia. Well, that's incorrect. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. Or somebody might say, my loved one has dementia, but they don't have Alzheimer's. Now that may be correct because they may have Lewy body dementia and they don't have Alzheimer's. But then they may have a mixed or a dual diagnosis where they have two different types because you can have Alzheimer's and vascular. You can have Parkinson's and vascular. You can have two different types of dementia at the same time. But there's over 130 different types of dementia we tend to see five to eight of them over and over again. The others are pretty rare. But dementia is a progressive impairment. It is a terminal illness. The only treatment that we have at this time is we do treat the symptoms. There is not a cure. It's a chronic condition. So one of the things that we do is we educate. And what we have found is the more that we educate family members, the more that we educate healthcare workers, the better we then are able to deal with the disease and the better we are able to help our families and then the better we are able to help our residents. So for somebody to have a dementia, then they've got to have the loss of cognitive function. And here's what's key. It has to interfere with a person's daily life and activities. And this is just some of those functions. Now you'll notice that memory is there and most people assume that dementia and memory loss go hand in hand, but a person can actually get a diagnosis of 
a Lewy body dementia or a frontotemporal disorder and not have any memory loss. It will come later. It will always come later. But a person can actually get a dementia diagnosis and not have any memory loss yet. A lot of, a lot of people don't know that. Now with Alzheimer's and vascular, some of our other dementias, we're always gonna see that memory loss first. But it's interesting to note that a person can have a dementia and not have memory loss yet. It will come. But typically what we will see is that there is going to be um, a loss in function in memory, thinking, reasoning, being able to be rational, judgment. Those are typically those first three that are listed there. Uh, being able to stay on task and then changes in language. We'll see that really early on because think about what's happening. Those neurons in the wiring in the brain are malfunctioning and eventually they're going to stop working altogether. We're going to look at a picture next that's going to show us what's happening. The ability to care for themselves, that sensory input and output, and then their movement and coordination. So as we look at this picture, and this is become a go-to picture when we're teaching about dementia. That brain that we see there on the left, that's a three pound normal brain. That brain that we see on the right, that is a one pound brain at the end of life from Alzheimer's disease. Now, if we were to look at a one pound brain at the end of life from vascular, Lewy body, frontotemporal, Parkinson's, uh, Huntington's, anything else that falls under the dementia umbrella, they're gonna look very, very similar. They're gonna be down to about one pound because the brain is dying in each of the dementias. It's not the same for everyone. If you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person with dementia because not all types of dementia are gonna manifest itself in the same way. You can even have 10 people with Alzheimer's disease and you're gonna have 10 different people with Alzheimer's disease. Most of them are gonna be characterized by that memory impairment. And it's going to become noticeable by others. And it's something that they cannot control. This is brain failure. I've had to take a person's MRI before and have families look at it so that they fully understand what's happening. Because early in the disease, sometimes it does appear that they're there sometimes, they're not there sometimes. Oh, dad can control what he's doing. Well, maybe earlier in the day, he is a little more clear than he is later in the day. And so maybe it appears that he can control what he's doing. But then you look at his actual brain because this is actual photographs of brain here. If you will notice those large holes that are here at the temporal regions, those are the language centers. And we're gonna talk about communication today. We have two areas of language in our brain. And it's gonna be really important to understand what happens in those areas as the disease progresses. And this is with each of the dementias. And again, everybody's disease progresses in its own way. So some people lose their language a little earlier, some people lose it later, but everybody's gonna lose it. Nobody's gonna fit perfectly into a box or a stage. And so as care partners, we have to focus on what they can do, not focus on what they can't. It is so important that we focus on what they have left and not on what they've lost. Keeping in mind that dementia is not a normal part of aging. Memory loss is not a normal part of aging. No memory loss is a normal part of aging. Slowing down is a normal part of aging, but memory loss is not. You're going to learn a set of skills as a care partner. It's probably going to be a set of skills that you never wanted to learn, but you will get a skill set. Those two language centers that I was talking about, the one on the left an easy way to remember it, and Tipa Snow is who teaches this. If you've heard of Tipa Snow, she's got some great videos that are on YouTube. Tipa, T-E-E-P-A, Tipa Snow. Left language leaves. Left language leaves. Left language is what we're doing right now. It's our day-to-day -day talk. It's that language that's really, um, it's part of that hippocampus. 
It's our nouns. It's our pronouns. It's our day-to-day -day banter. And it goes away. But the language that's on the right, and here's how to remember this, right rhythm remains, right rhythm remains. And think about what is rhythmic, rhythmic language. Well, usually when we think rhythm, we think music and music stays. People who've never loved music will react to music. And you'll see folks with dementia start to do rhythmic motions and rhythmic movements. They may rock. Now we all do this. Some of you may be doing it right now where you rock, your leg might be moving. It's called self-soothing or being rhythmic. Now they may do something or they may hit on a chair or they may pick. They're doing something rhythmic, repetition, because that side of the brain stays. But there's other rhythmic talk. There's rhythmic communication, prayer, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Poetry, nursery rhymes, Jack and Jill went up the hill. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. One, two, three, four, five. And people will count and people will say they're ABCs because that's all on the rhythmic side of the brain. But unfortunately, some other things store on the rhythmic side of the brain, on that right side, because they didn't store on the left side where our day-to-day -day talk is. Even if for some of us it became day-to-day -day talk, once upon a time when we were very young, we heard some words called curse words, sex talk, and racial slurs. And somebody told us, you better not say those words. I better not hear those words come out of your mouth again. And so we didn't store them on the left side. We stored them on the right. And unfortunately, they stay. And so people who have never used curse words, racial, racial slurs, or sex talk will use them because it's what they have left. They use what they have left. But if we learn to look past the words to find the meaning, because they may just be using those words, but what they're saying is, help me. But what's coming up out of their mouth is a curse word. Keep in mind, they're using what they have left and those words, unfortunately, store on the right side. Okay, so let's understand communication and dementia. And talk about um, moods and how our mood can spread to those around us. Think about that with communication. If you've ever been around people, there's just certain people that you're around that can put you in a good mood or certain people that you're around that can just put you in a bad mood. A person who has dementia, we know that their hippocampus is dying, it's going away, but their amygdala is staying intact. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that. But the amygdala is what controls our feelings and emotions. So even well into the disease, when they appear to have a flat affect on their face, they can still pick up on your feelings, emotions, tone of voice, gestures, and body language. They can read you, and they will be able to read you all the way to the end of their life. Because communication is about spoken word and nonverbal. And we're going to see a chart in just a minute that says that communication is only 7% word spoken. And that's for all of us, 7% word spoken. And think about that with dementia. They are still reading our body language. Another thing that plays into communication is our cultural background and our past experiences. And that stays with dementia. But everything about communication becomes much more difficult with somebody with dementia because not only are they having a harder time being able to communicate their needs, they're having a harder time understanding 
what we're trying to get across to them. So here are some more brain photos. So here are some things that they are going to lose where they're having a very hard time finding the right words. Now you or I are gonna do this. I'll do it during this program where I'll, I'll be looking for the word and I just can't find, okay, what is that word I'm looking for? Give me just a minute. But I'll either substitute it with another word or it'll come to me. Somebody with dementia, especially early in the disease, they'll start using the word stuff and thing. You know the thing, the thing, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, stuff, and the thing, and the thing, 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 stuff. Because they can't find the right word. Or they'll go to the word salad, da, 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 Where they're still having sound and they still can have, um, they can still most definitely, you can hear if it is a question, da, 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 da. Or they'll have just kind of a generic sentence. You know, yes, I said, okay, single phrases, sounds, or they just can't make their needs known. But singing stays. You may get lots of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially with rocking, that's self-soothing, automatic speech, a little baby makes their needs known, a person with dementia makes their needs known, we just have to figure it out, and then again, swear words, sex talk, forbidden words, racial slurs, those stay. Look at that, those two pictures to me are some of the most um, drastic and dramatic pictures. And these are all borrowed uh, from Tifa Snow's site, by the way, we've got it cited there. Here's a couple of more. Other things that they're gonna lose is immediate recall, attention to selected info, recent events and relationships. We don't ever wanna test their um, memory so please, please, please don't ever go up to somebody with dementia. And you're going to see this a lot. The holidays are coming up. And if you've got loved ones coming in, talk to them ahead of time to not come up and say, do you know who I am? That can trigger a challenging behavior. What's best to do is to come up and call them by who they are. Hey, Grandpa, it's me, Holly. It's so good to see you again. I just told you who I am. Because I've watched way too many people come up and say, first of all, scream, do you know who I am? And then they either get a stunned look from the person or they get a, I don't know who you are, you stupid, I don't even. And then they turn around to someone else and go, they don't even know who I am. And the look on the face of the resident when they realize I should know. Preserved ability though, long ago memories and confabulation, and that's a fancy word for lies because I can make up stories to be able to still have a conversation with you because I still wanna be able to talk and I still wanna be able to be part of the conversation. So maybe they'll make up stories. That's all right. Let them be part of making up stories and be able to be in the conversation with everybody. Emotional memory stay, they're attached to that amygdala. And we're gonna watch a video in just a minute that really talks about those emotional memories. And then motor memory stay. That's why people who have dementia will go in and out of physical therapy, occupational therapy and speech therapy because PT, OT and ST tap into motor memories. They're not teaching them anything new. They're tapping back into things that they already know. So if my video will come up, let's see if it'll start for me. Yay, it's going to. Okay, this is a short video and she is going to describe what happens in the brain with the amygdala in the hippocampus. She makes it so easy to understand. Um, she is from the UK. And so she's gonna use a couple of words that we don't necessarily use because she's gonna talk about an electric kettle 
and a whistling kettle for making tea. And she talks about putting the um, electric kettle on the hub and she's talking about the stove. And then she talks about having a row and she's talking about having an argument, but she's, she makes it very easy to understand. So we're just gonna watch this brief video to better understand communication as we deep dive into it. Hi, I'd like to explain dementia to you in the way that it was explained to me. I'd like to picture that I'm an 80 year old woman standing here and that beside me, there is a bookcase that's as tall as I am and is filled with books. Now, each of those books represents a fact or a date or a number or a memory that I've gained in the last 80 years of my life. So right at the top, my most recent memory. So what I had for breakfast, um, getting dressed this morning. The next shelf down might be things that are a little bit less recent. So maybe my last holiday, what I did at Christmas, maybe the last time you came to visit me. The next shelf down by my shoulders will be my 70s, my 60s, my 50s. My 20s will be down by my knees and my childhood memories will be all the way down by my feet. So that is the bookcase that makes up me. Now, when I get hit by dementia, what's going to happen is that my bookcase is going to start to rock. And I'm going to start losing those books, starting from the ones on the top, which may explain why my short term memory is likely to be affected first. So as my dementia progresses, I might find myself having lost not only the top shelf, but the next one down and the next. I might find myself living in the 1950s. Now, embrace my reality. I go into my kitchen today to make myself a cup of tea. What do you think, given that I'm expecting a 1950s kitchen, what's a likely accident that I might have? If you thought putting an electric kettle on a hob, that's absolutely right. Now, as my carer, as my relative, you might be tempted to say, we shouldn't let her make tea anymore, that's really dangerous. But there is a simpler solution, which might be to just change my kettle from an electric one to a whistling kettle, because that's what I'm expecting, and I know how to use that. And I learned how to use a whistling kettle all the way down in my childhood, so that memory is likely to stay with me a lot longer. That's not going to help everybody with dementia, but it might help me at this particular stage. Now, I talked about this one bookcase that's got all these facts and memories and numbers, and that's quite a flimsy bookcase, and when that gets hit by dementia, it rocks a lot. Now, this bookcase is representing a part of my brain called the hippocampus, which is more susceptible to dementia. However, my feelings and my emotions, the things that make me who I am and the reasons why you love me, they're all managed separately by a different part of the brain called the amygdala. And that's all here in a separate bookcase. It's a really strong oak bookcase. When that gets hit by dementia, it's not going to move very much. Let me explain to you how the two bookcases work together. So when I was a child, I had a teacher. He's on the hippocampus bookcase. He was incredibly inspiring. And the way that he made me feel inspired in all, that is self-stored in a separate book on my amygdala bookcase. So the teacher is on the hippocampus, but the way I felt that's going to be managed by the amygdala. Now let's bring it back to today where I'm the 80 year old woman. I have dementia. You come to visit me. That's a fact that happens here. And we have a blazing rap. I'm probably going to feel upset, sad, angry, and that's going to go onto the amygdala in a book here. You might go away thinking, it doesn't really matter. She'll forget that I even came to visit, let alone that we had a row. And you know what? You're probably right. That book will probably go. But what's likely to stay with me are those feelings, those emotions, that anger. And with nothing to relate it to, it might be really confusing to me. But let me leave you with a positive example. Say you come to visit me and you take me out to the seaside. And we have a great time. So here it is, the seaside, the waves, 
the great time, the feelings of safety and happiness and love that I feel are held over here in the amygdala. As soon as we get back to my house, I've forgotten where we've been. That book is gone. And you might think, oh, it's just not worth it. Why do I, why do I bother? I don't think I'm going to carry on visiting her. But look over here. Those feelings, that safety, that warmth, that's going to stay with me for a lot longer. So I would like to encourage you to continue to visit and to care for the people that you know, relatives, friends who have dementia, and to remember that there is more to the person than the dementia. Thank you. I have found that is one of the best videos at explaining exactly what's happening with the hippocampus and the amygdala. And the fact that a person with dementia still feels. They are most definitely still there. They still have feelings and emotions all the way until the end of their life. And it's so important that we understand and know that. So we're going to go through the three stages of dementia, keeping in mind that nobody there, we're, we're going to call them the three stages, but we also know that a person can be um, early in some aspects, mid in some aspects. There's also those cusp where maybe they are um, a little bit mild and a little bit moderate, but we're going to break it just for uh, the ease of this into um, early, mid and late. Then we're going to also talk about uh, best communication practices for the, the persons with dementia. So early in the disease, we really call this normalization. And there's a whole lot of information on these slides. I'm not going to go over every single bullet point. Y'all can read it and you're going to get copies of these. But early in the disease, they are going to be attempting to conceal their deficits. Of course they are. We would do that too. And they're going to be very good for short periods of time. There's a brand new study came out. If you um, follow the Alzheimer's Association, it was either this week or last week. There's an awful lot of research that shows that the higher level of education a person has, they tend to be able to conceal it longer. They tend to be able to compensate for the disease longer. There's also research that shows that what type of a career a person has, sometimes they can conceal or compensate longer. I knew a gentleman who was an insurance salesman. Well, he was very social. So if you came up to him, hello, my name is, and he put that hand out and people just meeting him, well, there's nothing wrong with him. Well, but you come back in two minutes and he'd do it again, like he'd never met you before. So this, during these early stages, these common changes that are going on, they are trying to conceal. This is where they are writing notes to themselves. Um, I've had people in support say where they started finding um, vitamins. Uh, maybe they started finding coconut oil or things where they bought themselves different uh, the things they'd seen on TV that are supposed to help with memory loss. They may use humor they may start getting angry. They may start telling us, it's us that I don't forget any more than you forget. They may start having some trouble socially. They may not want to go out as much anymore. They may start using curse words that they've never used before. And they may not even be aware that they're doing these things because they're not even recognizing the illness at this point. Early in the disease, for the most part, they can still do most things. They can still make their own decisions. And we can come alongside them and help them by just giving cues. Again, early part of the disease, we want to call this normalization. We want to focus on normalization. Um, they tend to know that something's wrong, just like with us. If something was going on with our body, we would know that something was wrong. So we want to, again, come alongside and maybe just give a cue or a hint, not a correction, because that may trigger some anger. Mood swings are very common during this time, and mood swings can come from frustration. There may be good days and bad days. 
It's very common early in the disease to get lost, to leave a stove or oven on, uh, to lock themselves out of the car or out of the house. Other common changes that we see early, doing something for the first time, like um, putting a fork in the microwave, putting the milk in the cabinet and the oatmeal in the refrigerator, those type things. Uh, having difficulty interpreting that background noise, trying to figure out exactly what it is that's going on. And so here are some of those challenges that we may see. where they're having a really hard time making decisions. And this may be before we even realize very much is going on. A menu in a restaurant, and there's just too many choices. This is where, with the communication, we've gotta be patient, and this is where we have to start limiting choices. One of the best things we can do with that is, I'm gonna have the hamburger, what do you think about a hamburger or maybe the chicken fried steak? And then we just limited it to two. Repetition. If they're asking it again, there's a reason they're asking it again. They're not remembering it. There's no reason for us to say, I just answered that. You asked that 15 minutes ago. There's a reason they're, in, they're asking it again. And that falls under down there on the bottom where we've got it, trying not to remind them of what they're not doing, trying not to remind them that they're forgetting, where we are gonna start shifting over to focus on activities that they enjoy, encouraging them to stay connected and promote their independence as long as possible. Focusing on normalization, focusing on what they can do in, instead of what they can't do. Making sure that we're talking to them and not excluding them from conversations. We accommodate the disease, they can't. And early in the disease, this is one of the hardest things for families to start to realize is how much it's, their disease is going to affect them. You know, our medical director, Dr. Knabel, has always said with that diagnosis, there's not one patient, there's two. And once we see the numbers that 68% of the time the spouse is going to die before the person with dementia, and now 64% of the time adult children pass away before their parent when they are the primary caregiver, because they just had no idea how much stress there was in being a caregiver. That's why we do these programs, so we can start learning about it as early as possible. We accommodate the disease they can't. We have to start slowing down, speak directly to them, and then give them plenty of time. As the disease progresses, and I'm talking about much later in the disease, it can take up to 20 full seconds, and 20 seconds is a long time. It can take up to 20 seconds for them to hear, process, and do. I've watched people fall and then put their hands out to catch themselves and they've already hit the ground. We looked at pictures of what's happening with that brain. We're the ones that get in a hurry and they are slowing down, their brain's dying. We've got to break those steps down simple, small steps, we have to start leaving the adjectives out of the sentences. Bring those sentences down three to five words early in the disease, three to five words, and then look past and look for the feelings and emotions and needs. Arguing and insisting never helps. Nobody likes to be told what to do but it seems to be in the earlier stages that we tend to argue more. And it's because we're figuring out how to do this too. So many times, again, earlier in the disease, if we get help from people that have authority, this helps a lot. 
like doctors and nurses and police officers and lawyers and the preacher and the pharmacist and the counselor or the DMV or whoever it is. And this is big things like driving. Sometimes we have to get the doctor to write it on the prescription pad that we can't drive anymore. And we have to get multiple copies of that. And that will work with some people. Because when they won't do something for you, they might do something for the nurse or the doctor or the lawyer because they're a person. It's amazing when somebody won't bathe for their daughter or for their wife, but you bring in a home health aide who has in scrubs and they'll bathe for them or they'll get in the shower with them. And all it is is they've got scrubs on. Or you bring in therapy into the house and they'll do so much more for somebody who has on scrubs or has on a name tag and it's just authority. This is also where we have to continue to nurture the relationship because our roles are changing, but we can't lose. This is still my husband. This is still my wife. This is still my mom. This is still my dad. Because if we do, our identity will become caregiver. This is part of what I work with in support group all the time is our identity can become caregiver and I lose mom, dad, friend. All right, let's look at that middle stage. And in middle stage, we're gonna move from normalization to supportive because now they are needing support in every area of their life. The middle stage of the disease is typically the longest stage of the disease with most people. This is where they are going to start requiring, probably needing assistance with all of their ADLs, that's their activities of daily living, so we're gonna have some changes with communication, changes with the way that they uh, move, the way they walk, the way they eat, the way they toilet, bathe, groom, getting dressed, all of those things. Remember those pictures that we looked at of the brain? Everything's changing. Uh, they may be, uh, time doesn't mean the same at this point, having trouble understanding and being, having trouble communicating and understanding communication. Also during the middle stage is where they are really losing their independence. And we want to make sure they have their independence for as long as possible, but their self-awareness of their abilities. Uh, during the middle stage, some families will say that the middle stage of the disease is actually a blessing because they don't realize that they can't do as much. Early in the disease can be very hard on families, especially if their loved ones saying things like, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I can't believe I can't, because they do come to a point as the disease progresses, they turn the corner and they don't realize that they can't. Usually in the middle stage is where they aren't recognizing um, some family members. Keep in mind that we're going back to a time, we're going back to who we were, and we haven't always had grandkids and we haven't always had kids, we haven't always had a spouse. We've always had a mama and a daddy, and we may have always had a brother and a sister. So many, many people will start calling their spouses their mama or their daddy. There's still somebody important. I still know I love you. I still know you're important. I'll always know you're important. But how could I possibly have children when in my mind I'm 20 or I'm 12 or I'm 15? Again, during this time is when we're gonna need assistance with all activities of daily living, major gaps in memory, and you may see confabulation during this time where they're trying to fill in the gaps. Changes to all five senses. Uh, during this time also, all throughout the disease, uh, all of the senses are changing. They're um, going to want to eat more sweets because their taste is changing, vision is changing, they're getting during the middle stage of the disease. It's like they have on binoculars, so they're not seeing all the way around. So our communication has to change. We've got to keep in mind a person with dementia is never giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. It may feel like they're giving us a hard time, but they're having a hard time. 
So during the middle stage of the disease, we really have to reduce distractions. We've got to engage in one-on-one -on -one communication. And whenever we are really trying to talk with them, we need to get in their line of vision, not standing over them, looking down, getting their attention by calling their name, calling their first name. If we work in um, healthcare with women, most of the time we need to call them Miss Mary uh, and not use their married last names because many times they don't know that married last name because they go back to their maiden name. So we may use just their first name. Never exclude them from conversations throughout the course of the disease. We all, even if it doesn't appear they're understanding, we saw that amygdala is intact. So we always want to include them in the conversation. Again, keeping in mind, what's the feeling saying? So in this part of the disease, a person may be using curse words, but maybe they're hitting at their stomach and using a curse word. Well, they're not calling you that curse word. They're saying, help me, I'm hurting. But you may say, is your stomach hurting? And they say, no, no. But they've got a furrowed brow and they're hitting their stomach. What are they saying? Yes, help me. But the word that came out was no. But their body language is telling you yes. Their brain cells are dying. They're doing the best they can with what they have left. We've got to be able to read what they're saying to us. Anytime they furrow their brow, this is all of us, if we've got a furrowed brow, something's wrong. We always want to check for pain first. And if you ask a person with dementia, are you in pain? Does your head hurt? You've got to use skills and really look at them closely because they may say no, but if they are holding their side, if they are uh, patting at something, they may very well be hurting and we've got, to, they're using their body language to tell us instead of their words because they're losing their words. And here at the late stage, this is the sensory stage of the disease because for the most part, the words are gone. They may have 10 words or less at this part of the disease. They may go back to those first 10 words that we learn. So they may have mama and data and they may say home, uh, sometimes they may still have a few names of people. Uh, every once in a while, you may get a love you or something along those lines. And again, everybody is different. So there are some people that will still have full sentences. Everybody's is different. They may regress back to childhood where they are needing to sleep more and eat less. This is the last stage of the disease. Their body is just trying to take care of itself. As the body st starts to shut down, it doesn't need as much fuel. It needs to rest more. So they have a really hard time understanding speech and then they don't have very much speech left. Their fine motor skills are very, very affected at this time. So if they are feeding themselves at all, they usually are doing finger foods. We don't just want to take over feeding them. We can use that hand under hand approach where we have their hands so they feel like they're feeding themselves. That's another tip of snow that you can um, go on YouTube and look at her hand under hand. Um, their, they, their joints may freeze. So we want to do those range of motion exercises. They may have hallucinations. And the other thing that we're going to see in somebody at um, this stage of the disease, uh, we talked about those repetition where they may rock, they may even say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you'll get lots of that is communication, that is talking. Sometimes that's self soothing, but that's also talking. You can still talk to somebody who's in that stage by using things like, really? Tell me more. I have conversations with people every day who are at this stage of the disease that aren't saying any words. And I will sit there and hold their hands while they is that right? And they'll talk back to me. You can still have that conversation. Also during the late stage of the disease, they will start to have weight loss because think about what is it that metabolizes the food? The brain is what tells 
the body to metabolize the food. So one of the things that families have a really hard time understanding is that a person doesn't die because they stop eating. They stop eating because they are dying. And that's what happens with dementia. But we want to, um, we tend to want to feed everybody. If they're sick, we want to make sure they're eating. But the body does start to shut down at this phase of the disease. So during this phase, nonverbal communication is key. We want to use uh, some chit chat, like what I was just demonstrating. Really, tell me about it. Show me. Is that right? We want to listen to music. We want to hold hands. We want to use compassionate touch because as we saw, that amygdala is still there. Those feelings and emotions are still there. We want to still have eye contact. We want to focus on what is there, not on what is gone. We want to nurture the relationship. So one of the things we want to make sure and never do with somebody who has dementia is to use the word remember. And this is at all phases of the disease. We never want to use the word remember. They have a disease that makes it impossible for them to remember. So why in the world would we remind them that they forgot? One of the things we like to say is they can't remember that they can't remember that they can't remember. So if we say to them something like, remember, we talked about, well, no, we didn't talk about it, you stupid. What are you even thinking? Fist, spit, kick, punch. We can trigger a challenging behavior just because of that word. So we don't want to use that word. Just get rid of the word remember. They don't. So we want to get rid of the word remember. We also don't want to reason with somebody who has dementia. They can't be reasonable. That brain that we looked at earlier, the ability to be reasonable and rational is right here. And you saw the atrophy. You saw how that brain was starting to atrophy or shrink. So the ability to be able to be reasonable and rational literally goes away. Their filter is also right here. That's the part of the brain that says, you should do this, you shouldn't do this. You should say that, you shouldn't say that. And it goes away. Some other communication tips, and I know we are, we've got about 10 minutes and I do want to leave a few minutes for um, some questions. So these last few, I'm going to go a little bit faster, but again, you're going to get copies of all of these. We never want to make it about them. We want to make it more about us. So if we can do something like saying, let's do this together. I could really use your help. I was having some trouble. Whenever I used to be the director of the day program, I tell you, I couldn't figure out anything. I was always having to have my friends over there help me with stuff. Everybody needs a purpose. Everybody needs a job. Everybody had, needs a reason. Now, this is something with the holidays coming up. We can be really bad about saying, no, mom, just go in there. We've got it. She's wanting to help. Let her do something. Even if it's sitting there stirring something you're not even going to use, let her sit there and stir. Let dad put some ornaments on the tree. It doesn't matter if he puts them all in the same place. Go in there and rearrange them later. Because think about what you're saying when you tell somebody, we've got it. You go sit down. Amygdala is working. I don't need you. We've got it. You're going to mess it up anyway. They can still hear that. If they're asking to help, they want to help. If they're showing up in the room, they're needing something to do. I was needing your help. Could you do this for me? If they're at home, could they peel the potatoes? Could you set the table? If we will set one of them, they might can mirror or copy and set the rest of them. We said we never use the word remember, but we always use the word okay. Well, you're the one that stole all my money. Okay. And now I'm going to fix it. Okay doesn't mean that yes, I did. Okay means I heard what you said. It's called validation. Okay. I didn't argue by immediately saying, well, I most certainly did not. You can't argue with somebody with dementia. But what if when somebody said, you're the one that took all my money, I said, okay, and now I'm going to use a therapeutic story. 
Now, some people call those lies. A lot of people at the Alzheimer's Association will call them fiblets. We have to go to their world. They can't come to ours. I had a gentleman used to come to my office every single morning where I used to work, and I had to call the bank every morning and have my name taken off of his account every morning. I called my cell phone from my desk phone and I mirrored his emotion because he'd say, you're the one that took my money. Okay, well, you sit down here right now because there's been some kind of mistake. I'm calling the bank and I would call the bank and get it fixed. And if he wanted to talk to the bank, I'd call the kitchen or I'd call the front desk or I'd call whoever and they'd talk to him. And then I would distract him away. I'd fix it. We couldn't stay right here in this office because if we stayed right here, he's going to loop back to it. And it's the same thing if we're at home with our loved one. If we fix something, we need to get to another room. We need to get to another area with a distraction so we don't loop back. And our four best distractions are food is going to be number one, the sweeter, the better. We talked about that their taste change. And for most people, sweet stays. I think that is a wonderful gift that we get from heaven above is that sweet is the one that stays. So ice cream can help a whole lot if somebody's starting to kind of ramp up. And music is another great thing. We talked about right rhythm. If we can get sweets with music, wow, that's a great thing. Now make sure you use their music, not necessarily our music, but their music with sweets. And then you'll see their animals and babies. So if you've got real animals or a real baby, that's great. But if you don't, YouTube has some fantastic videos. If you type in um, babies laughing, there are some two to three minute videos. I use it all the time, especially on an iPad. iPhones aren't great because they can't see them as well. Would you look at this baby? I wanted to show you this baby laughing. Would you just look at this with me? Would you look at this puppy? I've got this puppy. And because you can find the cutest little two minute videos, I'm not talking about watching a movie, something to distract. Food, music, children, animals. Here's that I was talking about earlier that 7% of all communication is words. 7% body language and tone of voice is the rest of communication. So over 90% of communication is nonverbal. 50% of all of our problems can be fixed with our approach. And unfortunately, in dementia, so many times we cause the challenging behavior. So we've got to be really careful. We want to come alongside them. We want to mirror what it is we're needing them to do because well into that mid stage, they can still do for themselves. Some people even late in the disease, if they see us do it. Act it out, demonstrate each step so that they mirror. This is a little bit more about that validation therapy. Validation therapy is actually where um, we are saying back to them, uh, just like the gentleman who came in my office and he was saying, you're the one that took all my money. By me saying to him, okay, let me call the bank, I'm validating him. I didn't try to argue with him. I didn't say I took his money, but I validated that I heard his feelings. That's all I did. It's called validation therapy. Validation therapy has active listening early to mid stage of the disease. This, and this actually is a good thing to use with anybody is validation therapy. This is part of being a therapist. So we validate people. The world of dementia is very, very different from our world. That first bullet point is so important. The person with dementia is not able to piece everything together, but their emotions are still very valid. Their mind is playing tricks on them. They may feel like a stranger. They may be afraid. We've got to try to enter their world. They're not giving you a hard time. They're having a hard time. Let me get to some of these other um, phrases to use. Tell me about it. Tell me more. I'm sorry that happened. That makes me mad too. 
I'm sorry I made you mad. Notice how I'm using lots of eyes and not yous. I'm sorry I was trying to help. I'm sorry this is hard. Boy, I have to use this a lot. I don't just do this as a professional. I do this personally too. I thought I told you about the appointment. I'm sorry that I didn't. Even though I know I wrote it on the calendar, I text before I got there and I called before I came. You didn't tell me anything about the appointment. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought I did. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and go. Sonic's on the way. Let's stop at that Sonic on the way there. They can't come to our world. We go to theirs. We do lots of sorries. Using validation and active listening throughout the stages. So here it's broken down by the early stage, the middle stage, and the late stage. Some different ideas there. Uh, and again, making sure we're looking at their whole body as well, because they will talk to us with their body, their body language. This is really important. A person with dementia is saying and doing things that are completely normal for a person with dementia. They didn't do anything to make it happen. And they can't do anything to make it stop. They would if they could. And they can't remember that you just reassured them. So we have to keep reassuring them. They're doing the best they can with what they have. And again, they're not giving you a hard time. They're having a hard time. And you are treating dementia. You're treating it right now. You're treating it by getting education. You're treating it with knowledge, by being flexible. You're treating it with compassion. There's our information. You know, we are always here to help. If you have ever got any questions. If anybody has any questions right now, we've got about a minute left. You can unmute or you can type in the chat. You will get these slides. You'll also get the recording. If you need a CEU, uh, we'll get those sent out to you as well. Any questions or comments? All right. Well, thanks for being with us today. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll get these sent out either later today. Jamie's in the class right now, but we'll either get it sent out later today or first thing tomorrow. I appreciate y'all being here. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of your day.